So we're going to start out tonight, before we get into God's Word, watching one more quick video clip to introduce our topic tonight. It's out of my favorite movie, uh, which happens to be Remember the Titans. So um, if you've seen that movie, you'll recognize the clip. And they're at Gettysburg, and they're, um, they've been at football camp, and the team is not getting along, and they're not functioning well. And uh, Coach Boone gets them all up in the middle of the night, and they run through the woods to Gettysburg, and that's where we're going to pick up this scene. So. seen that movie, it is definitely something worth checking out and, and watching. Um, I think you'll be uh, very impacted by it. It is a true story, interestingly enough, and uh, the high school that it was based out of, T.C. Williams, is just right up in Alexandria. I've actually drove up there and seen the school. Um, they're in the process now of changing the name of the school, but nonetheless, um, still a true story and a very impactful movie. Um, Basically, what's happened in here is the head coach shares this quote with him, and I love this quote. I killed my brother with malice in my heart. Hatred destroyed my family. You listen and take a lesson from the dead. If we don't come together right now on this hallowed ground, we too will be destroyed just like they were. I don't care if you like each other, but you will respect each other. I don't know. Maybe we'll learn to play this game like men. This was a very pivotal point at this point in time in this team and in this movie. Um, this football team, it's in the 70s, and T.C. Williams is one of the first schools in this area to go through segregation. And they're the only school in their district at that time to be segregated, so, or to be unsegregated. So it's one of those things where there's a lot of racial tension, and they're trying to figure out how to, how to fit all together and make it work. They're the only high school in the area where they have blacks and whites playing on the same football team, and they don't really like each other very much. Um, and if you've seen the movie, you know there's extreme racial tension there when the movie first starts. Um, they have to learn to come together as a team, and that's what the coach is telling them. Says, I don't care if you like each other. But you have to learn to respect each other. And maybe somewhere along the way, we're going to learn how to play this game called football. If they don't learn to work together, they're not going to win a thing. They had a decision to make right there in that moment. Are they going to work in unity? Or are they going to continue to try to do everything on their own? I share that clip with you because tonight we're going to think about unity. And why that's important for our soul. 
I want to kind of give you a quick re re rewind um, for those that, that this might be your first week with us. Some of you haven't been here all along. But week one, we've been talking about our soul and what our soul needs. We talked about week one about how we need a Sabbath. And you remember I talked about that we need rest. God didn't intend for us to go 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We all need to take a break. Even God took a break after six days of creating and then we talked about last week about ownership, that you have to own your soul, which means you're responsible for it. You have to take care of it. You have to make good decisions with what you put into your life and what you allow into your life. Tonight we talk about unity. How our soul needs unity with others. You see, at the beginning of creation, God, God had just finished creating everything. And life was perfect. And sin had not entered the world. And God literally was hanging out in the garden, walking along with Adam on a daily basis. There was no sickness. There was no death. Nothing could have been better at this point in life. Yet when God looked down in the garden of Eden at this point in time, he said, you know what? Something's missing. And that's where we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2 tonight, verse 18. It says, then the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Now, to me, it's completely crazy to think about how good Adam had it. Yet God looked at it and said, you know what? As perfect as creation is in this moment, there's something still missing. Adam, it's not good for Adam to be alone. Now, there's a ton of value in community and companionship. And God looked down at Adam and he realized that Adam doesn't need to go along and be the only human on earth. He needs to be united with somebody else. So God created Eve, Adam's wife. And from the start, God said that humans need community. Our souls need relationships with other people. Yes, you can survive by yourself. You can be a hermit. You can go way out in the middle of the woods, build a fort, and be all by yourself. But there will be always a part of you that feels like you're missing something. God never intended for us to be by ourselves. We aren't supposed to face life on our own. Having a healthy relationship and a healthy soul means that we, we connect with other people. More importantly... We connect with other people in a very deep way, in a very spiritual way. And, and to get us thinking about that, I want to share two examples to, with you tonight. We're going to go to our good buddy David. We've been talking about David all along. David's taught us some stuff about rest. He taught us some stuff about ownership. Well, interestingly enough, David's life is going to teach us some stuff about friendship and the value of it. The first one I want to talk about is Jonathan. Jonathan was David's best friend. Okay, Now, all of you in this room probably have a best friend. You're inseparable from them. Mel Meredith and Kelsey, I'll use them as an example. I, I live with them. I practically live with Kelsey. She's at my house more than I think she's at hers sometimes. When Meredith walked out to talk to me tonight, I knew that it was only going to be a matter of seconds before Kelsey came out the door. They're like attached at the hip, and I get it. They know each other's thoughts. You all have friends like that. That's the way David and Jonathan were. They, had fr they, they knew each other's thoughts. They could complete each other's sentences. Yet it's a very unique friendship because Jonathan is King Saul's son. Jonathan is the prince of Israel and in line to be the next king of Israel, not David. Yet God has appointed David to be the next king. So do you see the tension here? King Saul, now keep in mind, King Saul was also the type of guy that was always worried about what other people thought. You know anybody like that? Maybe some of you all are like that. You're always worried about what somebody else is thinking about you. That was King Saul. As a matter of fact, he worried about it so much that he failed to follow God. And that would create major problems for Saul. And really his wife Saul ended up not being able to, his family ended up not being able to be king of Israel anymore. Because he was more focused on what other people thought and less focused on what God thought. Well, King Saul makes David commander in his army and God blesses David. And David is an extremely successful warrior and and time and time again, David goes off to battle and comes home with these amazing victories. 
And after one very successful battle, King Saul heard people talking about how amazing David was. They, came, they come into the city, and people are praising them for their victory, and they're like, praise King Saul, he kills thousands of Philistines. And then somebody says, praise David, he kills 10,000 Philistines. Well, take a king who's very worried about what other people think about him. And now you've got David having a fan club, and Saul doesn't. You can only imagine how much jealousy grows. A matter of fact, it grew to the point where King Saul couldn't even stand to look at David. And he would make plans to try to kill him. Matter of fact, there's a couple times in the Bible where he throws a spear at him from across the room. He's so mad at David, just the sight of him. So David figures out that the only wise option he has is to run away if he's going to live. So he seeks help from his friend Jonathan. And once Jonathan realized that his own father was trying to kill his best friend, their friendship is at another level. Number one, Jonathan's devastated that his dad wants to kill his best friend. And number two, Jonathan knows that if he sticks his neck out for his friend, he could be risking his own life. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 42. I want you to hear David, uh, Jonathan's last words to David. At last, Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn loyalty to each other. In the Lord's name, the Lord is the witness of a bond between us and our children forever. Then David left, and Jonathan returned to the town. Those are Jonathan's last words to David. Incredibly powerful words about their friendship. Jonathan does go on to help David to get away. He does follow through on his promise. I just wonder, are you the kind of friend who only talks? Or do you help your friends out in their time of need? Are you really there for them when they have a need? You see, real friends look out for each other. Jonathan's decision to help David meant he was risking his life. If the king found out about all this, he could have killed Jonathan on the spot for letting David go. Yet Jonathan knew all of this, and he still was willing to risk whatever punishment his father was going to give him because he deeply valued his friendship with David. I want you to think about your friends right now. Just kind of start making a mental list in your head, picturing them, making a list of their names. I want you to I want you to think, if you knew someone who was going to try to kill one of your friends, what would you do? More than likely, more than likely, you'd do your best to help them out, right? Most of us are probably never going to be faced with this type of scenario. But we do experience similar things, every, similar things in our everyday life. And I want you to think about, are you helping your friends the way Jonathan helped David? Are you willing to listen to your friends? Now, just hear them. There's a difference between hearing and listening. Will you help them out when it's not convenient and easy? You know, it's easy to help somebody out when it's a piece of cake for you and doesn't require anything. Are you willing to do it when it costs you a little bit? When you got some skin in this game. You see, that's what real unity of the soul looks like. Is that you're willing to stick your neck out for that friend. Now, I can't answer for you, but I can tell you hands down. I have two friends in my life that I've known since high school. That I would do anything for. They, one lives in South Carolina, one lives in Tennessee. And they could call me right now and say, I need you at my house tomorrow. And I would move heaven and earth to get there. And they would do the same thing for me. So that's Jonathan's example for us. We need those type of friends in our life. Number one, not only do we need those friends, but we need to be those type of friends. For our soul to be healthy. Now, David also had another person in his life that teaches us a little bit about Unity of the soul. Yes, ma'am. I don't know her name, but I know you're talking about No, this is Nathan. <laughs> Nathan was a prophet. A prophet was someone God spoke directly to, 
And it was their job to take God's message to the rest of the people. Well, several years have passed since Jonathan helped David. And David has become king of Israel at this point in time. David's on his rooftop of his palace, enjoying a nice cool evening, when he looks out off his roof, and he sees a woman bathing on her rooftop. Now, I don't know about you, but I, there's always been a little part of me that, that when I read this thought, why is she bathing on the roof? Yeah, wait, that makes no sense. With, like, no shower curtain or no wall around. I mean, well, at least you, you know. She said, I'm going to look good. Talk about free Skinamax TV, man. It's right there. Well, during that time period, and in that area of the world, People would often bathe on their rooftops during the evening hours because it was a lot cooler in the evening hours. And after a hard day of work, you would want to be somewhere where you could cool off and enjoy a nice relaxing bath. Taking a hot bath in the middle of your bathroom where your house is probably already hot is not very calming or relaxing. So back to King David. He's out on his rooftop taking in this nice evening. He looks across the rooftop. And he sees this woman bathing. And he totally lusts after her. I mean, he, in his heart, he sells out. He looks at her and says, I want that. Doesn't matter that she's married. His best Not his best friend. No. Doesn't matter that she's married. Doesn't stop David from wanting her. A matter of fact, he was king, so he could pretty much get whatever he wanted. So he orders for Bathsheba to leave her rooftop and come to his palace. Then this so-called, quote-unquote, man after God's own heart, I'm not making this up, the Bible actually calls David a man after God's own heart. This so-called man after God's own heart commits adultery. Brings Bathsheba into his house and says, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. David should have known this was a bad idea. His arrogance and his lustfulness angered God. He should have known that he was getting in over his head. Well, rather than, than turning to God for help, and rather than seeking forgiveness for God, David tries to fix his mistake, and it just gets worse. I want to take a quick poll. See if anybody's brave enough to raise their hand. Has anybody ever made a mistake and then tried to cover it up, and it made things even worse? Yeah. I've been there, done that. Oh, not a fun experience. Oh yeah, not a fun experience. We all know what it's like to to make a mistake and then try to cover it up and be in worse situations afterwards. That's exactly what happened with David. David tries to lie his way through this, and when that fails, he basically has her husband killed on the battlefield and makes it look like an accident. And after the husband's out of the picture, David marries Bathsheba to try to cover up his pregnancy, or her pregnancy. David's considered one of the heroes of the Bible, okay? Nobody disputes that. You talk to any great Bible teacher out there, or pastor, and they're going to say David's one of the spiritual heroes in the Bible. I would even agree with them. Yet, he was far from perfect. I'm doing one of bed. If we're honest with ourselves, we've all done something we regret. But part of David's story is how God used him, to, and used him despite his mistakes. I want you to hear this clearly. God's love turns our mess into God's message. When we make mistakes and screw up, God's there to forgive us. That's what's amazing about our God. Maybe you're sitting here right now and you're listening to this story and, and you, you, you kind of identify with David. You feel a little worthless. You may even feel in love. Well, I want you to know that God never stops loving and caring about you. And that Jesus came to save all of us no matter how many times we mess up, how many different mistakes we make, how many times we get things wrong. Now this is where Nathan enters the story. God uses Nathan to speak truth, even hard to hear truth, into David's crazy messed up life. Now, see, it's pretty easy to be a Jonathan type of friend. Nathan gets a little bit tougher. 
2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. I want you to hear what Nathan's message to David was. Then Nathan said to David, You are that man, the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you my master's house. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Amorites and stolen his wife. Nathan learned all about what David had done. And he goes to David and he calls him out on it. Real friends are brave enough to call you out when you mess up. Real friends are like Nathan. They look out for you and they encourage you in your faith. They see our, our failures and they don't judge us for them, but they call us out on them and encourage us to do better. Nathan was that kind of friend for David. No doubt David thought he could just sweep his screws under the rug. And we talked about last week, you can't really do that. You just sweep it under the rug and it just gets worse. Nathan called him out in love and reminded him that God has something way better for him. See, that's what our soul needs. Not only do we need to have friends like that in our life, like Jonathan and Nathan, but we need to be those type of friends. Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by, overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back into the right path. I want you to hear that. You should gently and humbly help that person on the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. This is what it means to have unity in your soul with each other. To be willing to call each other out when you make mistakes. Not judge. Help them through it. Love them. Be there for them. Even when you need to tell someone the harsh truth. You know, I can tell you, I've learned in life that that's one of the hardest things to do as a friend. Is to go, somebody, go to somebody and tell them the harsh truth. We don't like to deliver bad news. Well, you don't do it because you want to judge them. You do it because you care about them. On a deep, soulful level. Think about these words for a moment. Share each other's burdens. Help that person. You see, our souls need community with others. God knew it in the very beginning when he looked down on the perfect creation and said, Adam doesn't need to be by himself. Tonight, I've kind of helped you understand what that community with others begins to look like. What that unity that we want in our soul, where it comes from. Our deep friendships with others. With us being those type of friends and us having those type of friends in our lives. Friends that challenge, you, challenge us to be like Jesus. You see, all of us make bad decisions and all of us mess up without thinking about the consequences. And sometimes... We make painful, selfish decisions that cause pain to other people. We're just like David, okay? None of us in this room are any different than him. But that's when we need to be friends. That's when we need friends to be there for us. Friends that aren't going to judge us. Friends that when we know we've messed up, we can go to and talk to, and they're going to pray with us and encourage us. And those are the type of friends we need to be. So I just want to leave you with a couple questions. I want you to think about this. How can you be a Jonathan to those around you? 
What will it take for you to become more selfless, a better listener, and more sacrificial in your friendships? Are you brave enough to ask a friend this question? And this would be a if you. If this came across on our social media this week as, as the weekly challenge. I don't know how many of you have done it or if you even saw it, but would you be brave enough to ask one of your friends, "Do you think I'm a good friend?" And then humbly accept the answer, whether it's good or bad. That's a tough question to ask somebody. Because you may not want to hear the answer. And then secondly, how can you be a Nathan to your friends? Is there someone you know who's stuck in sin and needs to be shown God's plan for their lives? Is there someone you know that you go to school with, that you talk to regularly, that doesn't know Jesus? Now, I want to remind you that Galatians 6 says that if we feel led to go and correct someone, we need to make sure we do it out of gentleness and humility. That's not about pointing a finger at them, but it's because you care about them. Maybe even you're sitting here this evening and you need to be called out like David. Maybe today is the day that God finally looks at, looks at you and breaks through and says, you know what? My ways are better than yours. And you just need to surrender and let me have control. The honest truth is, though, our souls need healthy relationships. And healthy relationships come from having friends that will be there for you no matter what. And friends that will, talk, will, will tell you the truth even when it hurts. Because they care and they love about you. They love you. Guys, I'm going to dismiss you to your small groups to continue this conversation. You're going to talk a little bit more about what unity is, what you think about when you hear unity, and kind of what it looks like to be those type of friends and to have those type of relationships in your life. So, as a reminder, middle schoolers start in the first room. High